Hello everybody! I feel like I haven't done a video in forever because I haven't, but here we are on episode 2 of In the Flesh, uh, my new series where we explore manuscripts, primarily medieval, but we're uh, shifting the rules a little bit here. Technically, it was still written in flesh. However, today we are talking about a Renaissance manuscript called Mira Calligrafia Monumenta roughly translated to Monument of Wonderful, Marvelous Calligraphy, but more commonly known in English as the Model Book of Calligraphy. Mira Calligrafia Monumenta was both written and illuminated in Vienna. However, it was written from 1561 to 1562 under the rule of the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand I, and it was illuminated about 30 years later from 1591 to 1596, under the rule of the Holy Roman Emperor, Rudolf II, who was actually the grandson of Ferdinand. This codex is commonly referred to as the last great medieval manuscript. However, it, as I just mentioned, is technically a Renaissance manuscript. The codex has two major sections. The first one is the model book, which is going to be the main focus and really the entirety of this video. And the second part is the alphabet. Now, before we get into the model book, let's talk a bit about the alphabet so we do have some context and information about what the first part is about. The alphabet is essentially an exploration or a showcase of Roman magic schools and Gothic mini schools. It is basically a celebration of the Greco-Roman past that characterizes the Renaissance in essentially any facet of art. This alphabet section is a really good example of what they call proportional theory. And this was a general rule used during the Renaissance in art to give new work what they would call an ancient spirit. The focus was basically on maintaining the proportions of Roman and Greek art, therefore giving new work that ancient look that Renaissance artists were going for. The section of the Roman magic schools includes a biblical verse with each letter, and each verse actually begins with the letter represented, and then it was later illuminated with representations of that verse. The Gothic mini schools, however, were barbaric and uncultivated to the Renaissance viewer, and they are illuminated accordingly. It includes a lot of grotesque faces, imagery, masks, and things that you would more commonly see in the margins of medieval manuscripts rather than in pillars of Greek architecture. But the part of the codex that I'm truly interested in is the model book, or the first part and main part of Mira Calligrafia Monumenta. I find it fascinating how it plays with the boundaries of the traditional relationship that text and imagery had with each other as well as individually. The text of it wasn't really meant for reading and the illuminations were not meant to illustrate the text. So what was the purpose of it? It is technically readable. Most of it, as was the tradition, is written in Latin, but a lot of it is also written in other languages, which we will discuss shortly. And it is it does include a lot of elements from the Bible, like manuscripts would very commonly do, uh, both verses, psalters, etc. But it doesn't, it's not in any order that would be, in which, that would make it become a prayer book, a book of hours, a psalter. It's not, it's just text. He just needed something to write and uh, he did not go with gibberish. So it, there is readable text, but it is not meant to be, see, to be used as a book, in the traditional sense of a book. Mira Calligrafia Monumenta is a perfect representation of the transition from medieval to Renaissance art. It is done in the medium and conceptual approach of medieval artists, but from the humanistic lens of Renaissance individualism. Now let's move on to talk about the people who made the book happen starting with Georg Boschke. He was born in Croatia and later became the court calligrapher to the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand I until his death in 1575. During medieval years, prior to the Gutenberg Press, we lived in a world where texts didn't simply exist in a vacuum. Texts existed within the physical represent representation of the written word. We have actually already discussed an example of this in this channel where we talked about Uncial script and how part of what drove the creation of it was the Catholic Church wanting to separate itself from pagan literature by using a new script. Scripts would change all the time 
over time, as everything does in the human world. So it is only natural for them to become associated with whatever the mentality and general way of thinking was at a specific point in time. So what happens when the letters that are going to end up printed are actually pre-made and then they all look the same? Well, first of all, you're less likely to have descenders turn into arrows that end up being shot in somebody's butt. But more importantly, calligraphy as a skill makes a shift from being the only means for a text to be preserved to being a method, a, a, an avenue of self-expression, just like any other type of fine art would be. Writing no longer has to be a strict scribal profession. It now becomes a humanistic practice. We have always seen calligraphy in manuscripts being a vehicle of the scribe's artistic expression. That's why we see them uh, variate the style that was standard and give it, uh, give each script their own individual touch to it. But this is really taken into a whole other level during the Renaissance because the letter's main purpose is no longer for it to be read, it is to be admired. To quote the Gettys publication on Mira Calligrafia Monumenta, the scribe self-reflexively recorded his own vital motion, free from the demands of figural representation. So this shift from calligraphy being a necessary skill to preserve the spoken word to becoming yet another form of fine art leads us to a very interesting trend, which is the rise of model books. These were calligraphy writing manuals, which like many other things in the history of humans, it became another vehicle of competition to prove who is the best calligrapher, who was the absolute walking encyclopedia of script styles, while still maintaining the absolute technical wizardry that calligraphy can be when put on paper. And so here comes our calligrapher Boschke, showing up his incredible encyclopedic level knowledge of such a variety of scripts, including Italic, Gothic Rotunda, Gothic Fractur, Gothic Textura, Antiqua, based on Carolingian Mini School, Roman Capitals, Greek, Hebrew, and other invented slash hybrids exhibition hands that he came up with. He even went to the degree of experimenting with the paper and the color of the paper. There are five folios that are black. They are so cool. And I actually, before reading about it, when I looked at them, I thought it was, uh, there was a black ink wash on the paper and then he used some sort of white ink or paint in order to do the calligraphy on those. We would see during medieval times, people would paint on paper that was dyed purple, for example. So this was, you know, felt like the general artistic process that this could have taken. But now the paper was first painted white, then given a black ink wash, and then he used some sort of clear substance. I'm not clear on what it was clear. <laughs> that was resistive to the black ink so that when he wrote the words with uh, this substance, the ink would dissolve and then it would show the white paint. So basically, he was the creator of those magic scratch drawing toys that we all had 20 years ago. You know what I'm talking about? Boschke got it. Boschke created a phenomenal collection of what people in the Renaissance who were just truly interested in previous and art in the past could do and really take it to the extreme and and just get crazy creative with it from using different uh, styles of flourishes and ascenders and descenders to making it as tiny as he possibly could uh, to even uh, to writing in the shapes of, of things there's there's one folio that that is that the writing is meant to look like a chalice it's really cool i'll put it here everything that he could think of that could be expressed artistically through calligraphy he made it happen so when we move on to the illumination of the manuscript i cannot help but wonder how would boschke feel about someone taking his masterpiece of work and adding stuff to it after he was dead and couldn't have any say about it. I mean, we're looking at calligraphy at this point just like we're looking at fine art, right? So it would be an abomination to take a painting that somebody made 30 years before. Mind you, it's not like it's a painting 
from you know a few hundred years before but still it's somebody else's painting and then you just decided to add your own elements to the painting because you think it'll look better it could it could look better but my goodness especially in the modern art world where we have such a reverence and respect for art that other people did and, and things that already exist being kept as impeccable and immaculate as possible this it is just a little cringy right but let's also look at it from the perspective of it is also a manuscript and it is meant to have uh, medieval sensibilities and in medieval manuscripts it was perfectly acceptable for people to come in and write on the margins and add illuminations to the margins later on the majority of these were planned or, or at the very least there was space left purposefully for illuminations to be added so then we go back into the thinking maybe this would would he have been happy with this choice because he did not purposefully leave space for illumination there are pages that have space but you can tell it wasn't meant for somebody else to put their own work on it because a lot of others don't uh, sometimes in the where we see spaces he purposefully uh, extends ascenders or descenders that take over that space and make the calligraphy look like its own piece of art also in other pages there simply isn't an obvious space but Hufnagel, which we are about to talk about, still made his way into every single page, which his illuminations. So to understand this, both the idea of wanting to expand on this masterful piece of art and to understand the topic of these illuminations, we need to really look into Emperor Rudolf II, who was the emperor who commissioned the illumination of Mira Calligrafia Monumenta and Rudolf II might sound familiar because we have also talked about him previously on this channel very recently so as we all already know because uh, he also having had Codex Gigas in his collection Rudolf II was fascinated by curiosities and he had what was known as a Kunst und Wunderkammer or Kunstkammer for short which is essentially a cabinet of curiosities it's more like chambers and rooms of art and curiosities he did not keep it to one single cabinet but he had rooms filled with things from all over the world that he found interesting these things included paintings sculptures coins, uh, fossils, animal specimens, precious stones, mathematical instruments, and of course, manuscripts. The mixture of scientific and magic interest was very characteristic of Rudolf's collection. He was very interested in the relationship between the microcosm and the macrocosm. The macrocosm being the universe and the microcosm being a representation of it in the human world. It aimed to reflect the richness and diversity of the universe. And this is the way that he approached collecting. He would have items that were skillfully crafted by humans right alongside wonders of nature, such as the stones and, and uh, exotic animals. Coincidentally, Joris Hufnagel, the artist of Mira Calligrafia Monumenta, was also very interested in everything that he saw during his travels. He was born in 1542 in Antwerp and he was actually a merchant by trade he was not a painter by trade even though that eventually became his main focus he served as a miniaturist and painter to the court of Rudolf II but more on a freelance basis rather than full-time the way that Boschke was employed and this is because contrary to Boschke he refused to work solely for the court and for any court for that matter he was very interested in pursuing his million and a half interests and hobbies sounds familiar just a little bit he was what academics call a true renaissance man he was interested in sketching drawing and painting but also in poetry uh traveling languages he played a variety of musical instruments and conveniently for him as a merchant he got to do all these things and also travel to all the places that he was interested in going to he lived of course in the netherlands especially antwerp and bruges he lived in germany frankfurt there was augsburg at some point at munich he lived in spain he actually spent a lot of time in spain especially in andalusia he lived in london for a while in venice in rome and of course ended up in austria during the rule of rudolf ii he had an absolutely fascinating life if you'd like to read more about it uh, the getty museum's publication 
on Mira Caligrafia Monumenta goes very in depth of where the places that he traveled to and the places where he lived and the specifics of how he became the illustrator and illuminator that he became. I do want to keep this video focused on the manuscript, so I'm not going to go into detail, but I will leave the link to the book below in case you want to purchase it and take a look at it. So Hofnagel comes along being an artist with just as much curiosity as Rudolf II's brain. So they were really a perfect match to work together. And on top of that, Rudolf II knew that his grandfather, Ferdinand I, loved Boschke, so potentially this was a, a, a tribute also to, to his grandfather's work. A way that we can clearly see how rooted in his travels Hofnagel's illumination was is because the flora and fauna has pretty much all of it been identified. That is also a really special element of the book that I just mentioned. It gives you all the information of what the actual illustrations are meant to represent. And they are clear, they are obviously not made up, they are meant to show what he has really seen. These images are truly meant to be a discovery of the world and the origins of these things like plants and, and fruits and, and insects and everything that he was illuminating. This was a marvel in, in the Renaissance world because let's keep in mind that so many of these items, of, of, of these specimens, have never been seen by the person who was reading or looking through the codex. This is this is new. This must have been extraordinary. This this was an equivalent, I think, of of for example when when that image of a black hole started rotating the internet and it was just the first time anybody has seen anything like that. Or or images of a solar eclipse and or seeing that in real life. How how spectacular that is, how you are in disbelief that you live in this world that can do these things that are not part of the, your daily life, but they're there. They, they're always there. And in this aspect, the illuminations provided by Hufnagel are really a, a good match for the calligraphy that Boschke did, because both of them are really meant to explore the depths of the curiosity of the human brain. Just everything you can think of and everything that you can create or represent that has existed and continues to exist is here in this book to be so admired. So we can see, understanding Rudolf II's point of view and Boschke's point of view and Hufnagel's point of view, how Mira Calligrafia Monumenta is truly in itself a microcosm. It is representing that diversity both in nature and in the human skill that the world contains. So going off on that tangent of Hufnagel's uh, painterly approach, ooh, sun, we're in December, this is fantastic, because it really was a visual investigation that would draw the viewer's eye to all of the nature's detail. We already discussed how the imagery has actually no relation to the script that is written in calligraphy, but the importance of this and, and why this is done very much on purpose is because he wants to use this imagery as an autonomous source of knowledge. He wants the viewer to learn about these insects and about these flowers and the flora and the fauna and the fruits and everything else that he is representing in these pages, not through paragraphs and, and written information, but through the images themselves. That is why they are so detailed. That is why he goes into the extent of making sure that he shows you fruits as a whole, but also fruits that are open so you can see the inside of the fruit and then there are insects alive and insects that are dead. <laughs> and there are flowers that haven't, that word, opened, huh, oh, this word, yet. And flowers from many angles and flowers bunched up and flowers individually. Uh, and it's, it's such a variety, a diverse way of representing elements of nature. It's not only meant to complement the calligraphy, it is also meant to teach you about the flora and fauna that is out there in the world. An interesting observation that makes this uh, quite obvious, that it's meant to be uh, individual, is how it is actually three-dimensional. 
Because when we compare this to a medieval matter marginalia, which is all two-dimensional and quite, you know, flat imagery, because that was the style at the time, it looks so different. It looks, it looks, it makes it almost not look like a medieval manuscript, because it isn't. But it is taking that template and exploring it with a modern lens. These illuminations were not meant to complement the text. It was meant to coexist with it. It was meant to equal its importance, rather to be secondary. It wasn't meant to just exist in the margins outside of what the scribe already defined as the text space. It went into the space of the calligraphy. It interacts with it. It even crosses paths with it. It is more comparable to the miniatures in manuscripts, in medieval manuscripts, rather than marginalia. It wasn't meant as an afterthought, it was meant to be just as important as the text itself, even though we all know it was an afterthought, so after that it was 30 years after. But the point is, as unrelated as it is to the actual text, it is placed there with the intention of it being equally important. Some of it even tries to imitate calligraphy. I especially love this one folio, I will place it here, where the legs of an insect uh, are very reminiscent of the uh, centers or flourishes uh, of that, that, that Boschke did in the calligraphy. And I very much believe that this was on purpose. Because more than a competition, more than, than Hofnagel as the illuminator trying to upstage uh, the calligraphy that was already there, it's not trying to take over. It is a match between these two artistic personalities. There's a funny juxtaposition between preserving obsolete scripts that have no real purpose beyond fine art, while discovering flowers and fruits and animals that the reader has never seen before. You're saving the past and discovering the present and the future at the same time, in the same page. And that, to me, is the true spectacle of Mira Calligrafia Monumenta. Thank you so much for joining me in the second episode of In the Flesh. Just like we did with Codex Gigas in the previous and first episode, I am thrilled to continue exploring minds and creations from the past that are just as obsessed with exploring knowledge as we are now. I'll see you soon with another video and have a fantastic day. Bye!